Amen, amen. Well, well, well look at this first. <laughs> all right, all right. It's good to be saved, right? Amen. Good to be in church, right? Amen. I'm not even going to ask you the third one. I'm not even going to ask you. Maybe I'll ask you later. Um, I'm going to mention a couple things about the book table. Uh, and uh, it will be there, uh, of course, uh, throughout Wednesday night. My wife uh, takes care of that. Uh, I, I always say it this way. <clears throat> she will be there to take your money. <laughs> Such a blessing. Uh, you know, I, I can testify after 42 years, she knows how to take money. And um, it is such a blessing to see her taking somebody else's. But um, basically what we have out there, uh, of course, you know the pastor, your pastor and I uh, worked together on a book. Uh, he did the hard part. He really did. He did the, he did the, uh, uh, the tough study. Uh, and it is out there. And, and I, like our, I, I like our books in this respect. They're there to be a help. Uh, you know, I, I, I wrote our, some of our authors a while back and I said, look, uh, if, you're, if you're writing a book thinking that you're going to get these endless monthly checks, uh, you got the wrong motive. We want to do something that will help people. Uh, that's what this book is. This is called The Book of Bible Problems. You know there are no contradictions in the Bible, correct? Amen. You also know the world claims there are. And sometimes somebody says, well, what about this verse and this verse? Well, and you scratch your head going, well, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, I, I, this is one of the books I call not a book. I know it looks like a book, but I'll tell you what it is. It's a bullet. Now, what do you do with a bullet? You load your gun, either go hunting or you defend yourself. Isn't that true? That's what this book will do. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it covers uh, the, uh, the apparent contradictions, uh, this verse against this verse. Uh, it is well done. It is readable. I like books that are readable. I'm not, I'm not too keen on somebody, uh, when you read it, you know you, gotta, you got to uh, consult the dictionary to find out what the guy was talking about. That book will help you uh, if you want to uh, be in the arena uh, as far as just uh, either either defend yourself uh, or uh, to go on the attack. Let me tell you something about your pastor. Uh, your pastor is your preacher, and he is your pastor, and he's a counselor and friend. Uh, and and uh, some of the guys this morning found out that he's your banker. But let me tell you what he's not. I'll tell you what your pastor isn't. He's not the church hitman. And a lot of people are delinquent on their own Bible knowledge because they think this. Well, if I don't have an answer, somebody asks me a question, I'll just have the pastor go talk to him. That's lazy, all right? And that's why that'll equip you to take care of yourself, all right? Uh, that's what this one does. Uh, this actually second book that I wrote. It's called The Answer Book. <clears throat> it covers 62 charges that are brought against uh, our Bible. Uh, just give you an idea. Uh, shouldn't we be loyal to the originals more than the, than the Bible? Uh, is Easter a mistranslation? Was King James homosexual? What about archaic words? Uh, what is the LXX? That is not a Super Bowl. Um, uh, what about the italicized words? And it just goes on, on through there. This is a real good uh, a reference. This is also a bullet, okay? This will load your gun. Uh, 62 charges they bring against your Bible. Uh, one of the things that I point out, that book came out in 1989. That is on the desk of the world's leading Bible haters. They hate that book. They hate that book and they hate this book. Guys, nothing in this book has been refuted. Nothing in this book has, has, have they gone to the Bible and said, this is wrong. So um, uh, that may be a help to you. I, I talked to a, uh, uh, this young girl came up to me. Uh, she was a college student. And I get this from college students, either guys or girls. Uh, and, and this girl said, I'm in Bible college, in a King James Bible-believing Bible college. Uh, and my, my, one of my professors uh, attacked the King James Bible and said that this or this was wrong. Uh, and she didn't interrupt him or, or uh, you know, uh, be out of order. She said, I just went back to my dorm room. I took the answer book off the shelf. I looked in the table of contents for the charge my, pa my, my uh, professor had given me, and I got the biblical answer. Uh, you guys believe this? The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. You believe that? That's why this book hasn't been refuted. It's not about man's uh, opinion. It is about <coughs> uh, the Bible being our final authority. Uh, this is called, Is Our English Bible Inspired? Short answer, yes. Long answer, not real long. I think 75 pages. Um, and uh, I'll tell you two of the things that this, this covers, uh, in addition to several other things. Uh, it, it covers uh, the importance of preservation as well as inspiration. Uh, sometimes, you know, like, like you see that little stand over there? You see the Bible on top of that. And what's holding it up, it says inspiration. And if you take inspiration, the Bible falls. Guys, that's the wrong picture. That is the wrong picture. It, the Bible is being held up on a stand with two legs. 
One is inspiration, the other is preservation. You pull either one of those out, uh, and it comes down, all right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have to study the, the guys that hate the Bible. Uh, there's a guy there by the name of Bart Ehrman. Uh, he's one of the, one of the world's leading uh, uh, textual critics that uh, doesn't like the, the Bible. Um, today, he is an agnostic. Now, this guy got saved. I'm telling you, this guy is as saved as you are. He got saved when he was, was 19 years old. Uh, through a, uh, he was Episcopalian, but he got saved through a Youth for Christ uh, Association uh, and, um, and went to college uh, all excited about uh, learning something about the Bible. <clears throat> and he went from Moody to Wheaton to Princeton. And he says, I went from being a born-again Christian to a fundamentalist to an evangelical to an agnostic. And you know why he's an agnostic today? Because he believes the very same thing you believe. He believes the very same thing you believe. Don't you believe this? Don't you believe if God had enough power to inspire the book perfect in the originals, he had enough power to preserve it to this day? That's exactly what he believes. He's got that in one of his books. But you know what? Here's, it's, it's how you view that statement. We look at it starting at inspiration and say God inspired it perfect, so he had enough power to preserve it to this day, correct? He started the wrong direction. His education proved to him that it wasn't preserved. And he said, if it wasn't preserved divinely, then it wasn't inspired. And it, it's, uh, it's a sad thing to happen to him. Uh, so this shows the importance of preservation. I say this, guys. Inspiration without preservation is a divine waste of time. Why did God inspire a book that he then turned around and lost or just didn't care to preserve? Uh, there's also a segment in here on the importance of being a King James Bible believer, not a Texas Receptus Greek believer. Some guys... Their faith falters uh, when it comes to believing that that book right there is the absolute perfect word and words of God. And so they kind of back into the Greek, pull a, pull a Greek around them and say, well, I'm a TR man. Uh, well, I got news for you. Your King James Bible is about 95% Texas Receptus. You say, what's the other 5%? God. All right. Uh, you don't have a verbatim uh, translation of the Texas Receptus. And so this... Um, uh, this shows the uh, import of that. Uh, this is also the only book right now that we have in um, audio book. So if you're too lazy to read, we have that for you. Um, I, I mentioned to the men this morning, I am not a Calvinist, okay? I was predestinated from the foundation of the world not to be one. I tried to be a Calvinist once, and not being one was irresistible. But um, a few years ago, I met with some, uh, some King James Bible-believing Calvinists. Uh, we had a, uh, we had a, um, uh, it, was, it was not so much like a, uh, a formal debate, uh, but a, a double panel discussion, uh, anti-Calvinist, Calvinist, uh, and uh, four hours. This is, I believe this is DVDs. This is, uh, yeah, two, two, two hour DVDs. So you got four hours uh, of, that of, that, of that discussion. Uh, and so, um, and I'll tell you what's uh, happening with where Calvinism is on the rise. First off, Calvinism is the theology of death. Every great religion that died, they, they, they had, that's what the, the Presbyterians finally went to seat on it. Uh, and, and it is flowing into the contemporary churches because there's no Bible in a contemporary church. And a Calvinist, you know, they, uh, somebody wants some Bible. And a Calvinist thinks if he can spell tulip, he knows the mind of God. Uh, and so... Um, we uh, debated some Calvinists, and, uh, and we won. <coughs> of course, it was predestined. But a um, um, couple of things here I do want to, I want to show you. I have, um, if, you would, if you would be so kind as to take a prayer card, all right? Uh, this is our prayer card. We've been on the road, like I said, for 29 years. I still get people that say, now, when do you go home? We will go home right after this service, walk right out there and get in it. But it's not a home. It is not a home, all right? All um, right. Uh, this, um, this has three, we have three websites. Uh, the, the, the top one is samgip.com, where, where I have my political rantings. Uh, you, you'd like it. You go on that, go on that page and uh, you'd spend some time. You go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I like that, oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, the samgip.com also has our itinerary uh, on where we'll be for, for a six-month segment. Uh, right underneath the Sam Gip uh, website is the Daystar Publishing website, which is my publishing company. Uh, you can go online and... and uh, get information, get, some, get the same stuff that's out there uh, online. Uh, and then uh, there's, uh, I have a site called BigDealKJB.com. We have six, mm, 10 to 12 minute videos 
uh, on the internet <clears throat> that defend your Bible, and they are devastating to the anti-Bible people. They really are. It's just driving the poor guys nuts. So, um, but here's what, here's what I'm asking you to take this. Um, I graduated from Bible college in 1973. Three months after I was out of Bible college, I was in an accident. I broke my neck. Uh, my doctor was the doctor you heard about that was practicing medicine because he had not perfected it by any stretch. Uh, turned me loose two weeks later. I went back to work for two months. I worked construction with a broken neck. Um, it was three months almost. It was 80 days before they finally did a fusion, uh, and they fused C6 and 7 together. Uh, in 2008, they took C5 out, uh, put a titanium plate between 4 uh, and 6. I have a titanium plate in here. Guys, I live for the day the Muslims try to cut off my head. I really do. I can just see them say, and now we're going to cut off your head. So I bet you can't. <laughs> I'm, well, you got to look at it. You got to look at the light side. And so, um, I, and so they did, uh, they, said they cut me here in uh, 73. They cut me here in 2008. Uh, they, they did another surgery back here in 2013. I got one clear spot. We're, we're holding out for more money. But um, I have people, and, and basically because of the uh, neck being misdiagnosed at the beginning, I spend every day in pain. Uh, and, um, and I get people ask me, they say, how did you keep from getting addicted to, to painkillers? Or how do, you, how do you get off being addicted to painkillers? And I'm not addicted to painkillers because I don't take them, okay? Uh, they're great. They work. But the problem is, then you end up uh, hooked on them. But let me tell you what I got addicted to, okay? And I'm, I'm asking you to help me with my addiction. I get addicted to prayer. Now that sounds like real, oh, that's really a cool thing to say. That's not, I didn't say that to be cool. I really did get addicted to prayer. Think about this, guys. It's better to be addicted to painkillers because you can buy those on a street corner somewhere. How do I make people pray for me? You can't make people pray. You can't buy prayer, right? If everybody that prays for me quits today, I will not be in the ministry seven days from now. I know that better than anybody else. So I'm just asking if you would, I'm not asking you to promise to pray any special time. <clears throat> I look at it like this, guys. If we can go to get onto a Baptist refrigerator, we've got like six opportunities a day of getting prayed for. And so um, we'll take the one about one o'clock in the morning over the pastrami sandwich. But um, uh, just if you would, uh, if you would ever, if you take a prayer card uh, and, uh, and pray for us, it would be such, such a blessing. All right, uh, that's, uh, that's there again. Uh, I'll, I'll mention more later. Uh, I want you to go in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation <clears throat> chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now, I, uh, I kind of subscribe to the, uh, the uh, whatever you want to say it, the teaching uh, of the seven churches of Revelation, chapters uh, 2 and 3. You've got those seven churches uh, as, as kind of like a... a uh, a history of the church across time, uh, periods of the, of, of the church since its founding uh, to, the, to uh, today, ending with the Laodicean church. Uh, but here's the problem. The problem is that when John wrote these, all seven of these churches were on the planet right now, weren't they? All right, then we're looking uh, at um, chapter 3, and it says this in verse 1. Now unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you now, God, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you, God, for your very, very great kindness. Lord God, again, as we come to you tonight, uh, we have no problem with you. We have no problem with your book. But Lord, we are a mess. We ask you now, Father, please take charge of this service. This is for you. Please take charge of this service. Speak the heart of each individual here, God. They came because they want something from you, and they want something from your book. And if they don't get it tonight, it will be my fault. So God, get Sam Gipp out of your way and out of their way, and speak the heart to each individual here and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, now, I am not a defeatist, and that's hard to be a Baptist and not a defeatist, because Baptists are great. I always say this, Baptists can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Baptists can find a cloud in every silver lining. There's something about Baptists, it's kind of like, no matter what happens, we have to look at the worst side of anything. 
Let me tell you what, when I got saved, I told you I got saved at age 20. Almost, when I got saved, almost everything in my life changed. You know what did not change? I did not begin to love our country when I got saved, because I loved it before I got saved. I've always loved my country. Uh, but after I get saved, I get with this bunch of Baptists, and they're, not, they're talking about communism. Uh, not only was it bad, I knew it was bad, but they're talking it's of the devil and has to go. Okay, man, I'm, I'm in. Then, about 1989 and 90, the Berlin Wall came down, uh, and, and the Soviet Union broke up, and some of the very guys that said communism, communism is of the devil and it has to go, they'd go, I had to say, they'd go, you know, I think the fall of communism was a trick of the devil. Could, could, I, could I ask a question? Aren't we allowed to win one? I mean, are we allowed to win one every now and then? Okay. And so I'm not a defeatist. I, I am not this, you know, let's just all give up. Uh, uh, I, I was talking to a guy one time, and he's saying, uh, tell me what was wrong. And I said, well, just do this. Oh, well, if I do that, then this will happen. I said, well, then do this. Oh, because no, then if I do that, this will happen. I said, I've got an idea what to do. He said, what? I said, kill yourself. He said, what? I said, just kill yourself, because I said, you've shown it's hopeless. I mean, no matter what you tell the guy. We are Baptists. If you could, if you could actually find a winning lottery ticket blowing down the sidewalk in the wind and you pick it up and you won a million dollars and your name was in the paper, you'd come to church, somebody go, hey, did you really find a million dollar lottery ticket blowing down the sidewalk and you got a million dollars? I'll guarantee you, here's a Baptist reaction. Yeah, but it was just one million. I mean, that's how we look at things, all right? We are defeatist. I am not a defeatist, I, but let me say this. We have lost some things that I don't believe we're getting back, okay? I am from a generation, and I'm sure some of you remember it. Uh, no, not when we tied the horses outside the church. But um, uh, I'm from the generation we opened when I was, I was raised in public school as a lost Roman Catholic kid, but we opened every school day with prayer and Bible reading over the PA system, all right? I think that's the way it ought to be. I don't think it's ever going to be that way again. Uh, I'm not saying, are well, you saying you're giving up? No, I'm just saying that, that, and look, look, I wasn't even saved, man. I was 12 years old when they made that change. I was a lost kid. That, that defeat was not my fault. That was somebody else. That was somebody else who ever uh, in charge of everything for God. All right? Um, I don't believe you're ever going to get the abortion clinics closed. I believe abortion is murder. I believe that. If you don't believe that, start today, okay? But I don't think, you, you say, you say, well, what if everybody in the country, I think every year they do a poll and more and more people say abortion is murder. You go, well, one of these days we're going to get it revoked. Are you kidding me? How many states have you seen? I'll bet you a half a dozen states have voted that homosexual marriage will not be allowed in their state. And did you ever hear this thing, one man, one vote? I didn't realize they were talking about a federal judge <laughs> because one judge overthrew the will of the state. If you think, you, I don't care if we voted 100% to shut down every abortion clinic, they won't shut down. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to see these states that have, have made smoking marijuana uh, legal. It's a, it's a drug. It shouldn't be legal. I don't think you're ever going to see them revoke that. All I'm saying is I think there's some ground that's gone. You can fight it if you want. I'm not against, you know, uh, uh, picketing an abortion clinic. And uh, I mean, I think you ought to resist all that. I'm saying that there's some things we've lost. I don't think we're going to get back. But I want you to look at verse 2 in this chapter. Because that's not what this chapter is talking about. That's not what this verse is talking about. It said, be watchful and strengthen the things, what? Which remain. <clears throat> he said, you've lost some things, guys. And he said, you know what you need to do? Strengthen what you still got. I'm going to talk to you tonight about three things that we still have. Undisputed. Absolutely undisputed. You will say, yep, we got that, we got that, we got that. We still got it. And, and, and here's what you're saying. Well, how do we hang on to that? You don't hang on to it. You're never told to hang on to it. Look again at that verse, and there's a word here that you have got to wrap your mind around. Look at the, it says this, be watchful and, what is the fourth word of that verse? Come on, what is it? Strengthen. You know what it isn't? What it isn't? It isn't maintain the things that remain. It is strengthen the things that remain. You know, I didn't realize uh, when I was lost, that I learned some spiritual lessons when I was lost. I didn't realize till years later when I was saved and I saw a spiritual application to some things that happened in my life before I got saved. Now, let me explain. And, and, and I had this happen while I was pastor at church. 
uh, I, before I got saved, I was a street fighter. I was a drunk and I was a street fighter. Now, please tell me, guys. Come on, I know you all watch TV, but please tell me. You don't really believe anybody fights like they do in a movie. You don't really think two guys go, uh, hey, can I hit you in the head with this bottle? Oh, sweet knee. Let me take off my hat. <laughs> oh, oh you, oh, you know, I think I'm going to need stitches. But before I go to the hospital, uh, could I break this chair over your head? Oh, of course. Nobody fights like that. Hey, you know, this may be a revelation to you, but you don't get hit with a pipe three or four times and win the fight. Well, I saw Schwarzenegger. They hit him with a pipe and he won. That's written script. Okay, that's not a human. That doesn't happen. Uh, I got bad news for you. I don't care what your karate teacher told you. Nobody whipped six guys at one time. It doesn't happen. They were, uh, they were interviewing uh, Chuck Norris. And Chuck Norris, is, has, has, I understand he's gotten saved. But Chuck Norris, this was years ago, and he's a big karate guy. Uh, and they're doing this TV interview. Uh, and they said, uh, what would you do if six guys surrounded you in an empty street? And he said, oh, he said, no problem at all. He said, I'd pull out my 357 and shoot all six of them. <laughs> he said, I thought he was a karate guy. He's also a realist. Yeah, I, I can just hear his karate teacher. I will teach you to kill with one finger. <laughs> I, I can kill with one finger. Guys, that doesn't happen. Let me tell you what happens. First off, you know what's happening 30 seconds before a street fight starts? You got two guys facing each other, and they're telling each other what they're about to do to each other. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do this. That's, what, that's what's going on. 30 seconds after it starts, they're on the ground. One of them, usually the guy on the bottom, is hitting the other guy in the fist with his face and having visions of world peace, all right? And, and guys, that is what happens. Now, that is hard on you, but I'll tell you what else. It's hard on your clothes. I mean, you get holes in the knees of your pants. You get holes in your elbows. You get your shirts torn off. I remember one night I came home, and the only thing I had left of the shirt that I left home with was the collar that was still attached to the buttonholes. And that was it. That was all I had left of this shirt. Now, I, here's how I look at it, ladies. I'm sorry. I, here's how I think. I thought my mom would appreciate less laundry. That wasn't how she looked at it. So uh, I had this friend of mine. He's a little Irish guy about this big. His name was Billy Murray. Billy was a Golden Gloves boxer. Now, I wasn't a boxer. I was a fighter. And, uh, <clears throat> and so one night, it's a winter's night. Uh, I don't know why we were walking down the street, but I stopped under a, a, a street light, and I said, I said, Billy, teach me stand-up fighting. He said, what? I said, teach me to fight standing up. He said, why? I said, well, if I learn to fight standing up, I said, maybe the next time I get in a fight, I can take care of business standing up, won't tear up the holes, put holes in my knees, won't tear up my shirt. I was thinking of my mother. And so um, I said, teach me stand-up fight. Now, guys, I don't know anything about it. So we start sparring. And I know, you know, I, I, he, I didn't even know I was supposed to lead left. I'm leading right. He said, no, no, lead left. So I'm, I'm jabbing, I'm jabbing, I'm jabbing. I'm looking for a place to bring this right in. And I'm watching because he's a trained boxer and I'm not. And so I'm watching, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm jabbing, I'm looking for something. All of a sudden, while I'm doing this, I go, uh, look at all those stars. I don't remember seeing, oh, look at that red star. That's pretty. Look at the blue star. That's nice. Look, orange and green. I don't remember seeing all these stars before. I thought, man, I'm just going to look at these for a while. They were beautiful. Well, they began to fade, and, and I kind of shook my head to clear it. And here's Billy standing in front of me. He's grinning like a Cheshire cat. I said, Billy, what just happened? He goes, uh, you seen stars, didn't you? I said, yeah. How'd you know? He goes, I got you. I said, what do you mean you got me? He said, I mean, I, didn't, I, I never saw the punch. This day, I can't remember seeing that punch come. He said, he said, I got you, and you've seen stars. Well, now, guys, I'm kind of quick on the uptake sometimes, and now I realize that my boxing career, much of the time is going to be spent seeing stars. And so um, I said, Billy, what is the standard operating procedure when somebody hits you so you see stars? I got to know, because I think I'm going to do this a lot. And he said, standard operating procedures, if somebody hits you so you see stars, you take that right, you throw it out there as hard and as fast as you can. I said, Billy. I can't even see you. Why would I throw a punch? I don't even know you're there. He said, there's two reasons why you do that. He said, the first one is this. He said, when you, when you get hit so you see stars, you tend to drop your hands, and, and that's what you did. And he said, the guy's going to kill you. He said, throwing that right out there, it puts it between him and you. He's got to work around it for a second or two, just maybe a long enough time to clear your head and save your life. Then he told me the second reason. It was in the second reason 
that where the spiritual lesson resided. I didn't know it until years later when I passed through the church. But he said this, he said, the second reason you throw that right out there, he said, in order for, for me to hit you so you see stars, I got to be open to the same punch. And there's just a chance you'll get the guy. And I said, let's go. So we start sparring. Now I'm being, I'm being exceptionally careful. You know why? Because it wasn't until this night, I knew Billy for years, but it wasn't until this night that I realized that my friend Billy Murray had not two, but three arms. He had two like a mere mortal, and then he had a tentacle that could come around while you're watching the front two and hit you so you see stars. So, so I'm trying to be very careful, all right? And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm still looking. I don't think I ever hit him. I, you're not smart, I don't think I ever hit him. And, and so, so, you know, I'm throwing, he's throwing, and all of a sudden, he's, whoa, look at those stars. It was a yellow star. That's pretty, pretty orange star, blue star. Oh, purple. We didn't have purple before. <coughs> and so I thought, okay, what did Billy tell me to do? Oh, that's right. He told me to throw my right out as hard and as fast as I can. I did. Here's exactly what I did. Oh, look, there's a green star. Oh, there's a blue star. There's another blue star. I mean, it must have taken like an hour and a half to throw this punch. It was like punching through peanut butter. Billy could have gone home, taken a shower, eaten a sandwich, and come back and ducked this punch. So I throw this right out. Uh, he didn't tell me anything to do after that, so I enjoyed the show. I'm watching the star. I, okay, right's out. I'm done. And I'm looking at the stars. And they began to fade. I shook my head to clear it. I can't find Billy. It was like the, the rapture happened. <laughs> I mean, he's going, I'm looking around, I can't see him, and I look over, and going through a snow-covered yard, he's like this. I said, whoa, Billy, Billy, I said, I was watching him, I said, you were chasing him. I said, what happened, Bill? He said, you got it. I said, what happened? He said, he said, I hit you, and he said, you hit me, and we're done. <laughs> But, but what he was saying was, to be open to that punch, you've got to be, you, if you throw that punch, to a knockout punch, you've got to be open to the same punch. Now, let me superimpose that <clears throat> over a lesson, uh, over, over when I pastored my church. Um, guys, I don't believe this. I am not. First off, let me say, I hate this phrase. I hope you never use it. Let me be the devil's advocate for a minute. Whenever I hear somebody say, let me be the devil's advocate, you know what I hear? Let me be the devil. Why, do you, why would any Christian want to argue the devil's point of view? Well, I just think his... No, 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 look, we're not talking about voters' rights, okay? You know what blessed me? Nothing would bless me more than if something bad happened and the devil had nothing to do with it and everybody blamed him and I'm the only guy that knew he didn't have anything to do with it. And he'd go, well, Gip, aren't you going to tell him? Say, no, let him blame you. You deserve it. So I'm not the devil's advocate. Now, that being said, a lot of what we blame him for I'm sorry, guys. He wasn't even in town the weekend it happened. <laughs> a lot of what we blamed him for, he was surprised when he heard about it. You know, the devil, the devil made me do it. I'm not sure he made you do half of the bad stuff you do, all right? But sometimes it is an active work of the devil. And, and you go through in your personal life, and sometimes as a church corporate, you go through a, a demonic or satanic attack. Uh, and I pastored this church for five years, and, and, and I'm up there in, in New York, and we were going through an obvious attack by Satan. It was obvious to everybody in our church, the devil was really hammering us. And, and when that happens, let me tell you how you feel. You feel like, like you see the tornado on the horizon and it's coming your way. And what do you want to do? Get down in the tornado cellar, secure the doors, ride out the storm, and try to come out having not lost anybody. And I, I got up in front of my church one Wednesday night and I said, folks, I said, you guys know that we are going through a satanic attack right now. My whole church knew it. It was very obvious. And I said, as your pastor, let me tell you how I feel. I said, I feel like I want us to draw back into the bunker and just kind of brace ourselves for this so that we can get through this and not lose anybody during the satanic attack. But I said, we're not going to do that. And I said, let me tell you why we're not going to do this. Because I said, I learned a lesson before I got saved that if somebody throws a punch at me, they're open to the same punch. And if the devil is throwing a punch at us, we're not ducking. We're throwing another punch back. Now, so, you, you, here's another thing about Baptists. We would, we would rather make a perfect, sinless, loving God angry than we would the devil. 
oh, watch what you say. Don't make the devil mad. Guys, he's already on the attack. I told you, we're already in the middle of an attack. And we don't want to, we don't want to upset him. And I said, I said, let me tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to play it safe. I said, we're not going to pull back into the bunker. We're not going to ride out the storm. We are not going to try to maintain what we have. I said, we're going to get through this. But I said, we're going to go beat in the bushes. And I said, when we get through this, and we will, I said, I want a new family in our church. We went through that thing. It was about four weeks. Seemed like six months, you know. And uh, we went through that thing about four or five weeks. <clears throat> when we got through that, we had a brand new family. The man, his wife, and three kids got saved, joined our church. You say, what happened? We didn't maintain what we had. We what? Strengthened it. We are admonished by God not to maintain the things that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. We are not told, hang on to these because, boy, guys, I mean, come on. Am I not talking to people who, in the last six years since this guy's been to the White House, we have seen things happen in our country that we never thought we'd see in our lifetime. You say, well, they're never going to close the doors in this church. You don't know anything. You don't know anything, right? Because what's been unheard of that's happened, more stuff can happen, all right? And so I'm going to talk to you about three things that we still have, and I'm going to tell you how to strengthen them. I'm not going to tell you how to maintain them. I am not going to tell you we need to pull back into the bunker and try to ride out the storm because this storm's not going to go away. It is not going to go away, and we're going to have to maintain them. The first thing, as far as strengthening the things that remain, strengthen your freedom of worship. You understand there are people in this country, most of them in government now, most of them in Hollywood and public education, most of those people hate our freedom of worship. They hate the fact that, that we are free to worship. Let me ask a question. I'll ask this. I've never gotten the, the, uh, uh, in the answer, but the one I expected. But you people that are here tonight, uh, on your way to church tonight, were any of you stopped and told uh, you're not allowed to go to church anymore? Okay, I didn't think so. That hasn't happened yet, has it? But you remember this morning I said you had dinner on the grounds and this is not your last dinner on the grounds? You know, for all you know, this might be the last service in this building. Joel, so, well, what could happen? I have no idea what could happen, but you do understand things can happen. Isn't that true? And so, guys, there are people that want to shut down our freedom of worship. You need to strengthen. I didn't say maintain. I said strengthen your freedom of worship. You say, how do you do that? Real easy. Show up. You understand that every church, not your church, every church, including your church, there are in every church three churches. Every church has three churches. You know what they are? Sunday morning, Sunday night. Do you, you have Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday night. All right, so you got every church has a Sunday morning church, a Sunday night church, and a Wednesday night church. I've yet to ever see it where Sunday morning was the small crowd and Sunday night was the big one. You know why? Because Sunday morning shows how popular the church is. Sunday night shows how popular the pastor is. And Wednesday night shows how popular the Lord is. You've got people, you know, I, if I ever pastor a church, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I, I'm going I'm to have everybody come, show up, have show up at night and say, now I just want you to see what this building looks like in the dark. You know, there's people who've never seen their church building in the dark. You say, why? Because they do their religious obligation Sunday morning and they're never coming back. They'll, well, we'll be there again Sunday morning. Now, I don't need to tell you that because you're here Sunday night. But I will guarantee you if this was a normal week, and this is the normal Sunday night crowd. Some of you never show up for midweek. You did your Sunday morning. You did your Sunday night. You did your thing. You're done. Hey, guys, you need to be here every time the doors are open, every time the lights are on. Your pastor did not say something. And I'm glad because <clears throat> sometimes pastors say this at the beginning of a meeting, and I don't agree with it. Uh, they say this. Now, we got these services till Wednesday night, and you come to every service, and you come expecting a blessing, because if you don't expect a blessing, you won't get one. I don't believe that. I don't think you guys ought to be here for every one of these services because I'm here. I really don't. I think you ought to be here for every one of these services because it's your church having a meeting. Because the doors are open, the lights are on, and there is a preacher preaching a meeting. It's not because of me. It is because it is your church, and you ought to be here. And if I'm preaching, trust me, don't come expecting a blessing. <laughs> Because you might get discouraged. Do you ever go to, a, do you ever go to a, a restaurant expecting a good meal only to find out that some poor animal died in vain? Let me tell you something. On June 14, 1970, that, that Sunday morning when I walked into this church, I, wa I got saved in a church just like this one. A King James Bible-believing independent Baptist church. You know what the difference was? The only difference. 5,000 people. 
in that church. Guys, that is either a big church, an aircraft carrier, or the capital of South Dakota. And I went into that church that morning. You know what I was not expecting? I was not expecting a blessing. You know what I got? I got the, I got the surprise of eternity. I walked in that building that morning lost. I walked out of that building saved. I didn't go in there walking and say, oh, maybe something good is going to happen. Guys, you shouldn't come into service saying, I want something, I'm expecting something good. Just show up. Just show up. Be here. You need to be here every time the doors are open. Uh, there are people in this room. You come Sunday morning, you come Sunday night, and you come Wednesday night, and you won't come Tuesday or, or, thir- or, or Monday or Tuesday, and I know what you're going to say. Well, I had a guy tell me this one time. Well, preacher, religion's like a steak. Overcook it, and it's ruined. I agree 100% with that statement about a steak, (laughs) but not about church. I love these people. Did you ever hear them say it? Well, I just don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm of no earthly good. You know, I found a bunch of Christians found a shortcut. They found a way to be of no earthly good, and they never did get too spiritually minded. They never got so heavenly minded. They just found a kind of, just kind of jumped out there to being of no earthly good. And some of you, you won't be here Monday and you won't be here Tuesday. Now, the real reason is you don't want to miss your favorite TV program. But the fact is this, guys, you need to be here every time the doors are open. Let me tell you about a young man. He came to a meeting of mine. It was a Sunday through Wednesday like this one. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he came up to me. I walked in Tuesday night, and this kid walks up to me. He is really excited. And he goes, uh, and, and he's just beaming. And he goes, he goes, you know, he said, I'm so glad to be here tonight. He said, it's amazing that I am here. Now, let me explain something, guys. I mentioned this morning, I'm a writer, okay? Guys, I, you have to pick your words carefully. And you have to be, when you write, you know what you have to be beware be, be of? You have to be aware of exaggerating. I mean, you know, come on, it's amazing. I mean, unless you flew here by flapping your arms, I, I'm glad you're here. It's not amazing. And I, I didn't think it was quite amazing. I mean, I, I, I hate exaggeration, guys. I wouldn't exaggerate in a million years. And so... Um, <clears throat> And I said, well, it's probably good that you're here. I don't know that it's amazing. He said, no, it's amazing. I said, why is it amazing? He said, I got saved three months ago. He said, ever since I got saved, I've been here every Sunday morning. He said, I came every, I got saved. He said, I've been in church every Sunday morning, but I never came to any of the services. He said, this week, I came Sunday morning, Sunday night. I was here last night. I'm here tonight, and I'm going to be here tomorrow night. I said, well, that is really good. He said, no. It's amazing. I said, why is it amazing? This is what his answer was. I said, why is it amazing? He said, I am addicted to lost. Now, if you don't know what lost is or was, apparently lost was some kind of a TV program. Never saw it. I never saw it. Uh, It's a story about some some airplane, probably a Malaysian air, uh, crash lands on an island in in the ocean. And these people are stranded on this island. Now, I never saw the show. I, I looked for it one time, couldn't find it. Apparently, it was lost. But, um, uh, but, but from what I can tell from the advertisements, like everybody in the world is on this island except you and me. I mean, there's like 18 million people on this island, okay? He said, I am addicted to Lost. He said, I've seen every program. I've got every episode on DVD. He said, I never miss it. And he said, it's on tonight at 7 o'clock. And he said, I left my house tonight to come to church. My brother said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to church. He said, lost is on. He said, yeah, I know, but I'm going to church. My brother said, you want me to record it for you? And he said, I turned and said, no. And I said, that's amazing. (laughs) Hey, guys, you know what he was doing? He was being in every single service. You know what I'd be... I'll guarantee you that kid never went back after that meeting. I'll bet he never went back to Sunday morning Christianity. What I'm telling you guys is as far as your freedom of worship, expand it. You can't maintain it. You can't stay where you are. That is not what the verse says. It does not say maintain. It says strengthen it. So as far as your freedom of worship, strengthen your church attendance. As far as your freedom of worship, strengthen your personal involvement. I have a name for the average Christian. It's not a derogatory name. It's not complimentary either. It's just the best description I can come up with most Christians, and it probably describes a bunch of you. I call you guys pew warmers. You know why? Because that's your one talent for God. When I get done preaching tonight at 1130, and we leave here, there's going to be this much foam on one of these pews 
that 10 minutes after we go, this much foam is still above room temperature, and that's all you're doing for God this week. You can warm a pew. Really, you want that your accomplishment? Maybe you're going to get a trophy in heaven with a brass pew on it, you know, and, a, and a, maybe it'll have a glow plug on it or something. Guys, guys, you know what you need to do? You need to get involved. You need to increase your personal involvement. Let me tell you about a man. Now, this man was, uh, he was, he was out of step with the times. You know what our times are? We are in end times, correct? The Bible says in the end times, you know one of the things it says about men? They'll be fierce. Everybody in our country has the attitude of a professional wrestler. Did you ever notice that? Oh, you two tell me. You know, I watch them. You know what they do? They pull up to the traffic light and don't even look at it. It's red. They don't even look at it. You know what they do? I'm going to work on my phone, and when the light turns green, the guy behind me will blow the horn. Okay, I'm the guy behind him. I'm more than happy to help. I hit the horn, and the guy waves an obscene gesture at me. And I'm thinking, how does he know that I'm not a serial killer on the way to the mall, and I'm just going to make him my first victim? But everybody is fierce. I call them chess beaters. Oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. That's what, you know, that's got a thing, you know. You know, because here's what we believe. We believe as long as I can still beat my chest and get tattoos on my muscle-bound arms. That's what I'm not going to show them to you. But, um, I mean my muscle-bound arms. Um, we think that still makes us tough men. And I'm telling you, look, bikers today are run by women. I will guarantee you bikers are, 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 are afraid to be politically incorrect. Well, let me tell you about this man. This man's name was Donald Vaughn. Donald Vaughn was not a chess beater. Donald Vaughn was not a macho man. Donald Vaughn was not a fighter. He was a farmer. He was also my father-in-law, my wife's dad. Donald Vaughn was a dairy farmer. You know anything about dairy farming? You know what those, those guys all but marry those cows. A dairy farmer takes his vacation between the morning and evening milking. That is the only time he's got off. They don't go away. Now, you don't put the seed in the ground and come back when it's, when it's, when it, when it's ready to harvest. My father-in-law was not a, a tough guy. My father-in-law was not a macho man. I don't think I ever heard my father-in-law raise his voice to another human being. <laughs> to a human being. I heard him raise it to cows a couple times. Now, he didn't cuss them. He just said things about steak and hamburger. But um, the best way I could describe my father-in-law is that my father-in-law... If there was a group of men, Christian men, my father-in-law wouldn't stand out. He never stood out in the crowd. But he was always in the crowd. He was always there. Well, my father-in-law, you know, he finally went home to be with the Lord. And, um, and, and when he had gone home to be with the Lord, uh, before attending this church of 5,000 people, my wife's family, uh, they went to another church, and that church got wandering away from the Bible. And so they came over to this church where Kathy and I got saved, uh, where I got saved, and Kathy and I met and we got married. And, um, and so after my father-in-law passed on, somebody found from that other church, they found an old 1960s church directory. It was saddle stapled, black and white pictures, and they sent it to us. And we're going through this thing, and here's this picture of five guys dressed up for church, suits and ties, and my father-in-law is one of these five guys. And we read, and here's what the caption said. Here's our church deacons. Never knew my father-in-law was a deacon. He just, he just wasn't going to just warm a pew. Turned another couple pages. Here's my father-in-law standing next to a 1955 GMC school bus. But it doesn't say school bus on it. It says church bus. And the caption for that picture said, Here's one of our church buses and the bus driver, Donald Vaughn. When Kathy and I met, the first time I took her home to this, to this farm where they, where they worked, where they lived, uh, you know, typical long lane. And I pull up by the barn, and right beside the barn is this gold-painted school bus. The Kent Baptist Temple, where I got saved, where we met, had 40 school buses, church buses. And they were all painted gold, and their motto was, follow the gold bus to Sunday school. And my father-in-law, being out in the country as a farmer, he was so far from the bus garage, from the church, that rather than drive in Sunday morning and get the bus, they left it at his, at his farm, and he'd just do the route out in that rural area, take everybody to church, bring them back, drop them all off, go back and, and do the afternoon milking. When he died, my father-in-law was active in the Awanas program in his church. Now, I'm telling you this, if you ever, look, if you're ever going to get in a fight and you want somebody to back you up, mm -mm, don't get my father-in-law. He'd go someplace to pray. But he was more than a pew warmer. You know what he decided? He decided somewhere in his life, early in his life, I'm going to be more than just sit here and, and warm 
this much pew. I'm going to find some way to be personally involved. Guys, why don't you get personally involved? Increase your personal involvement. You say, well, how would I do that? I don't, I don't know. Ask him. You know what I've never had? I've never had anybody come up to a pastor and they said, Pastor, I want to do more for God. And the pastor went, ah, you're okay. Well, we don't need your help around here. <laughs> Guys, I'll bet your pastor has something you can do. And if by chance he doesn't, ask God if he has something you can do. I know he won't tell you he's got enough help. When my father-in-law at, at the funeral, there's, uh, there's eight children in my wife's family. And, uh, and so we're all standing over here. And, and you guys understand, some of you understand, that you don't realize there comes a time in your life when, when the only time you see people after 25 years is at a funeral. And so somebody would walk in, and, and one, of the, one, of her, her, one of her siblings would say, uh, oh, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so. Well, this guy walks in. This guy walks in with a business suit on, tie, dressed up, businessman. He walks up to the open casket, looks at my father off for a few minutes, turns to walk away, and he sees the family start standing over here. Nobody knew him. Nobody could figure out. They said, you know him? No. And they're, they're, the brothers and sisters are talking between each other. Do you know him? No. Do you know him? No. I don't know him. None of us knew him. And so he gets done. He walks over and he says, now you're Don's children, right? And the, and the kids stepped up and the, the brothers and sisters identified themselves. He said, now you, you don't know me. No, nobody knew him. He said, when I was a kid over at the first church, he said, your dad was my Sunday school teacher. And he said, when I was eight years old, your dad led me to Christ. Say, what was he? He just was more than a pew warmer. He was just determined, I'm going to do more. He was not Mr. Personality. He wasn't the chess beater. He wasn't the, I'll show you what I can do for God. He wasn't like that at all. But he wasn't going to just sit and warm this much foam and go home saying, I did my duty. Guys, you know what you need to do? Find something you can do. Say, God, show me, show me something that I, I want to get. I want to increase my personal involvement. And guys, get more personally involved. As far as your freedom of worship, increase your church attendance, increase your personal involvement, increase your mission giving. Now, when I say mission giving, I'm talking about missionaries. You had a missionary here this morning. I don't know if you guys support him, but if you might want to think about it, all right? Uh, I noticed back there, I was praying for your missionaries. I try to pray for the missionaries. I try to find the mission board and pray for every missionary by name. I did that this morning uh, after I ate. I mean, first things first. But, um, but I prayed for them. But let me tell you, let me tell you what's going to happen. I, I hate to say it because we're in a recession. Now, you know what kind of recession we're in? The kind you can't find a parking space at a restaurant. We're in a kind of recession where watch a college football game and inevitably you'll hear this, a record crowd. How do you have record crowds at football games in a recession? How is it you can't find a, a, a parking spot at a restaurant during a recession? That is no recession, okay? But we may be headed for one. We may be headed for a depression. We may he be headed for the disillusionment of our country. I think we may see the day when trouble really, really comes. And one thing that's going to happen is it's going to hurt our finances in a big way. And when that happens, it will not be a bad man. It will be a good man in this church. And he'll come up to this pastor and he'll say this. Now, preacher, you know I care about missions. But we're falling on hard times. You know, we've got to take care of the home front first. Maybe we need to drop some of our missionaries so we can take care of here. Guys, don't do that. Don't do that. When I come into a church where I've never been, like this one, uh, I judge them. I say, you're not allowed. I can do what I want. I already judge you guys. I look for two things. I look for two things. Actually, three. I look for a track rack. You got it. I look for a mission board. You got it. And I look for a really big love offering. Anyway. <laughs> so we'll see how you do. But um, <coughs> no, you know what the track rack tells me? The track rack tells me the church cares about its locality. This is your Jerusalem. And you need to care about your locality. Isn't that true? That's why you guys went visiting yesterday, correct? But then I look for a mission board. You know what that tells me? The church's vision goes beyond the horizon. Guys, you have to keep your vision beyond the horizon. Not if you say, oh, yes, because that's important. I'll tell you what's important. It's important for you to be looking out there because if you're not looking out there, you start looking in here. And then you get so self-centered. And if you start dropping that mission support, it, it, it may sound good, but here's the problem. You now brought your vision into just right here within these walls, and you're already cooked. I told you when we're in the West, we go into uh, Asia. 2012 was a Western tour, and, and I, I went over to uh, Australia, 
And I was talking to an American missionary. There had been eight, he'd been there for eight years, got there in 2004. And he said, when I got off the plane eight years ago in 2004, he said, you could buy, with one American dollar, you could buy two Australian dollars. An Australian dollar is worth 50 cents. Man, wouldn't you like to have $2,000 a month coming in, get off the plane in Australia, and instantly have $4,000? <laughs> don't, don't leave yet. Because um, that was 2004, and I'm talking to him 2012. When I got off the plane in 2012, you couldn't get two Australian dollars for one American dollar. You ready? You couldn't get one Australian dollar for an American dollar because the American dollar was worth less. It took a dollar three American to buy one Australian dollar. I think two or three weeks later when I left, it took a dollar fifteen American to buy one Australian dollar. Now think about this. If no churches dropped that guy in eight years, and if no churches dropped him in eight years, I'd be, I'd be shocked and surprised. But if nobody dropped him in eight years, his mission support was cut in half because of inflation because of the, of the devaluation of our dollar. Isn't that true? You don't really believe he's the only country that, that was affected. You know, might, this might be a good time just to uh, tack on another five bucks. Well, where are we going to get it from? Get it from you. That's where you get it. Come on, guys. I hear guys say this. You know, uh, you could just uh, not go to McDonald's one time a month and you'd have something to give to missions. I'm going to tell you the truth. You go to McDonald's as much as you want, you still got money to go to missions. You could get anything you want. You know why? Because you're, you know what's happened to us? Our, we still buy toys. They just got more expensive. You know, when I was a kid, if you want to go play, you know what you did? You went bowling. And if you were, if you like got to be a fanatic, you bought your own ball and a bag to carry it and bowling shoes and a glove for one hand. A glove. Can you picture it? For one hand. You know what that makes me think of? It makes me think, do you know what the Cleveland Indians outfield and the late Michael Jackson had in common? Oh, yeah, they did. You know what they had in common? Both of them wore a glove on one hand for no apparent reason. Anyway, but you know what I wonder? How much can you spend? If you, if you got to be a bowling fanatic and you bought a ball and a bag and shoes and the glove, how much can you spend? I'll bet less than a four-wheeler. I'll bet less than a jet ski. I'll bet less than a ski vacation or a fishing trip. What I'm saying, guys, is you're stacking away money for toys, and you could give some of that to your missions. I did not say give that to me. I said that give that to missions, all right? Guys, what I'm telling you is you need to increase your freedom of worship, increase your church attendance, your personal involvement, and your mission giving. The second area that you need to strengthen, not maintain, strengthen your aggressive Christianity. Now, I am a believer in aggression. I am sorry. I believe that offensive and I believe the word aggression are going to be, are going to be driven from our, our glossary by a bunch of effeminate men or overbearing women. Well, I just don't like aggression. Are you kidding me? Wait, would you like to watch Tennessee go out in the field and not be aggressive? Can you see, can you see Tennessee lining up? Now, guys, don't hit them too hard. We, we might hurt somebody. I was listening. They were talking to some, some linebacker. And he said, uh, I think it was Dick Butkus, I don't know, but he said he'd rack them and crack them, you know. Uh, he was like a full-time linebacker and a part-time chiropractor. And, um, and he said, how do you know? He said, what's the best part of your job? How do you know you did your job? And he said, when I hit a guy and I'm standing up and I hear him say, Mom. <laughs> he said, that's when I know I've done my job. Now, could you be, oh, that's so cruel. That's our problem. We have no aggression. Are you a defensive driver? I hope you're a defensive driver. Because I am an offensive driver. I really am. I am the reason you live, okay? If there were no offensive drivers, you defensive drivers would have no reason to be here. So I, I give your life a purpose. And I believe in aggression, all right? I really do. <clears throat> I believe in aggressive Christianity. I don't like things that are passive. So how, what do I do with my aggressive Christianity, guys? Pass tracks. Pass tracks. You know, uh, if you're like every other Baptist, you like eating and you like free. Baptists love things that are free. I mean, we will line up to get stuff that is free. When you hear about somebody being given something, you don't go, boy, that's a blessing. You say, where does the line start? Because I want to get in. We like free. Here's the amazing thing, you guys. You come in here past a track rack where the tracks are free. You don't sell them to them, right? They're free. Okay. You walk past free tracks on the way in here. 
You walk past free tracks a second time on the way out of here, and then during the week you're talking to somebody and you go, oh man, I wish I had a track. And who are you going to blame for that? I mean, your church tried to give them away and you wouldn't take them. You can't say that the dog that ate your homework when you were in high school also ate your tracks. Guys, I think you ought to grab some gospel tracks. Now I hear this. Well, but preacher, I'm just not good at talking to people. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you the great truth of preaching. This is the great truth. There is one great truth to preaching. If you get this great truth, now I shouldn't say it with two other preachers here, but, but this is the great truth. If you get this down, you can be a great preacher, and here's what it is. Now, here's what we want. When we preach, um, we want to say something that, that is so correct that the Holy Spirit says amen to it by, by convicting you. That's what it is. So we want the Holy Spirit in a service to convict you about something. Well, here's the great truth of preaching. In lieu of conviction, intimidation will work. So what do you mean? If I can't get the Holy Spirit to get you under conviction, then I personally will intimidate you until you feel guilty. And I'll make you think you're under conviction. I'll show you how this works. I'm going to intimidate you. Now watch. Here's how this goes. You care about people dying and going to hell, don't you? Of course you're going to say yes. I'm nervous. Nah. Everyone's going to say yes. You don't want the lost to die and go to hell. No, no, no. And how many of you witnessed to two dozen people this week? You don't really care about souls. I don't really care about souls. Guys, I, I hate to tell you this. That's not conviction. That's intimidation. I say that because if I can't get the Holy Spirit to get you under conviction, then I'll intimidate you. Do you know how you can tell the difference? It's real easy. When the preacher's done preaching, if you want him to know you're not the dirty rat he was talking about, you've been intimidated. If you want God to know you're not the dirty rat he was talking about, you've been convicted. And so here's what I'm supposed to say. When you say, well, I'm just not good at talking to people, I'm supposed to say, you're a coward. You don't care. You'd let the world go to hell because you don't want to talk to him. I'm not going to do that. You know what I'm going to tell you? Don't give them to human beings. No, don't give them to cows and dogs or anything. Why don't you get a, po why don't you get a, a pocket full of tracks and ask God this? Could you show me where I could use these this week without handing them to another human being Show me where I can put some tracks where someone will find them. Guys, there's all kinds of places you can put tracks. You can put them in restaurants. You can put them in, uh, probably you guys don't ever go like shopping anything, you know, like the grocery stores or Walmart or anything like that. Guys, are, I, I knew a church up in New York. They had a track passing competition up in Rochester, New York, and they went crazy. They went... This pastor bought 5,000 tracks. He said, for the next 30 days, we're going to see how many tracks we can pass. They went through 5,000 in three days. They ended up going through like 100,000 tracks. He said, I'm getting calls from people say, in Georgia saying, hey, I bought a pair of blue jeans in a store in Rochester, got home and found a gospel track in my pocket. Thanks a lot. It was amazing. Guys, there's all kinds of places. Hey, I'll tell you a great place to put tracks. You want to know where? the track delivery slot on a car. You know where that is. That's where this guy, he's coming through town, and he, and he wants a track so bad, but he's got to go into the restaurant, or he's got to go into the gas station. So you know what he does? Just for you. He leaves his window down that much so that you can come by and slip that track in for him. That's what he's waiting for. Don't break his heart. Would it be something to get to heaven and have somebody say, you say, how'd you get saved? And say, hey, you know, I was in this little place, you probably never heard of it, Trenton, Tennessee. And I had to go in this restaurant. I left my car window down that much. When I came out, there was a little pamphlet on the seat. And I, let it, I read it, and I got saved. Guys, all I'm telling you is, be more aggressive. Now, guys, you can't get aggressive uh, track passing if you don't have them on you. <coughs> I'm not a counter. It's okay if you count. I'm not a counter. I don't count. Some guys say, well, I passed 1,000 tracks this week. I passed 10,000 tracks this month. I don't know how many tracks I've ever passed since I got saved. I only know this. I started passing gospel tracts as soon as I got saved, and I've been passing them in June. I will have been saved 45 years. I've been passing gospel tracts for 45 years. Now, the first one wasn't this one. Uh, you saw the first track I passed. Most likely you did. Any ever, anybody ever see the gray and pink Simple Plan of Salvation track? Is that not a classic? 
That's the first track I ever passed. Let me tell you the first track I ever passed. I passed it to a guy named Louis Brio. Let me explain. My family was, uh, we were actually Romanian, and, uh, and there was no Romanian Catholic church in our town, so we went to the Roman Catholic church. I was 20 years old when I got saved. You go down the street and across 6th Street, on the corner was the Ramos family. Tony Ramos lived there. Tony was a year younger than me. The Ramos family was Italian Roman Catholics. They went to the same Roman Catholic church I went to, St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church. Directly across the street from Tony's house was the Brio family, Italian Roman Catholics. Uh, Louis was about uh, a year older than me, about 21 years old, about six foot two, about 250 pounds, and they went to St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church. So we're all going to hell from the same church at that time. The first person I gave a gospel tract to was Louis Brio. You say, why? Well, I don't know about you, but when I first got saved, I wanted people saved, but I wasn't sure exactly what to do. But I knew this thing was all taken care of, so I gave him this track. Now, about two weeks later, maybe that, that long, uh, Tony Ramos wanted me to tell him about the Lord. Don't you love it when they want you to tell him? And Tony wanted me to talk to him about the Lord. Now, now, he was pretending to be working on his car radio as I walked by, but I'm sure what he really wanted me to do was witness to him. And so, uh, me, not to break Tony's heart, uh, I sat down in the front seat while he's you know, sparks are flying underneath the dashboard, uh, and I'm talking to him about the Lord. Well, while I'm talking, Louis sees us. He comes out of his house, and he comes up to the curb. He didn't cross the street. I don't think he was allowed to cross the street unless his keeper was there. He just, boom, 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 boom. And he stood there, and he's watching us. And I can see him over there, all 250 pounds of him, which really made me want to talk to Tony a whole lot more. And so I'm witnessing to Tony. Now, guys, one of the things about witnessing is you got to know when the witness is closed, when it's over. You have to be able to perceive that. And I could perceive that this discussion with Tony was over somewhere right about the time he said, get away from me, don't talk to me anymore. That was kind of a giveaway. So I get out of the car, and across the street, Louis goes like this. And I went, Me. Well, I was saved long enough. I wouldn't say very long, but I saved long enough. I knew what to pray. I'm crossing the street, and I'm going, rapture. Great time for it. Mild coronary, please. And um, I get across the street. I said, Lou, what can I do for you? He said, Sam. He said, you know that little pamphlet you gave me? I said, yeah. He said, if I was up in my room and I read that, he said on the back of it was a prayer. He said, if I read that and I prayed that prayer, am I saved? I said, he, he said, he got, got down on his knees in his room. I said, Lou, did you do that? He said, yeah. I said, did you mean it? He said, I did. I said, Lou, you're saved. Now, guys, I don't think that just getting saved is repeating, you know, one, two, three, repeat after me, five, six, seven, now you're going to heaven, eight, nine, ten, let's do it again. I know I forgot four, but let's go get some more. But guys, there are people that got saved reading gospel tracts. And my friend Louis Brio got saved on the first track I ever passed. You know what I didn't know as I was talking to him? I didn't know I wouldn't see Louis for 14 more years. 14 years later, I was on the staff of the Masson Baptist Temple, church about 2,000 people. I went to visitation one night, and they handed me a bunch of three by five cards, and the top card said, Louis Brio. A different address in Maslin, but as my friend Louis, I said, I gotta go. Now, I believe he got saved, but you know there's a chance he didn't. And I don't want to secure his place in hell by assuring him that he's saved when he's not. I sat down in his living room, and I said, Lou, I said, let me ask you something. I said, uh, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you'd go to heaven? He goes, yes, yeah, Sam, I sure do. I said, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? He said, you're not going to remember this, but, and gave me that testimony almost word perfect like he had 14. I'm telling you, my friend Louis Brio got saved on the first gospel track I passed. I've been passing these for almost 45 years. You ready? I've never gotten the second testimony of somebody getting saved. Preacher, are you saying they don't work? I didn't say that at all. That's not what I said at all. I said, I haven't gotten the testimony. Did I tell you my father was a farmer? My father-in-law? Because I wasn't. I don't grow nothing but weeds, okay? But let me ask you a question, guys. If I, uh, not being a farmer, if I took a bag of seed corn and put it over my shoulder and I just walked across fields and un unplowed fields and unmowed fields and I just walked across this country and all I did every time I saw a field, I just threw a few handfuls of seed corn. First question, would it all come up? No. But it all would not come up, would it? Something would find a way to get up. Isn't that, isn't that right? Guys, you ever go past a bean field 
and see a rogue stalk of corn? That's one of my tracks. I was there. Guys, something's going to take root, isn't it? You know, I come into churches like this one where I've never been, and somebody says, uh, I read one of your books and it helped me. I understand that. That's why I write the books. Uh, I heard a sermon on the internet or, or someplace and it helped me. I understand that. That's why I preach. But you know what I get to do? One of these days, I'm going to cross over to the other side. I'm going to find out something about my life I don't know anything about. You say what? Where all that seed fell. I'm going to find out how many other people like Louis Brio got saved because they just picked up a piece of paper that I just left laying someplace or handed to them somewhere along the line. I get to find out something about my life that I'll never know. And guys, you can too. You say how? Grab the seed corn on the way out of the church. Make sure you get, get rid of... Look, look, I don't even say one a day. I didn't even say seven a week. Try to get rid of five tracks a week just for the rest of your life. And, and when you get on the other side, you find out what's gonna, what happened to it, all right? Increase your, your aggressive Christianity, your passing of tracks. I'll, I'll go to the next point, but I, I want to tell you this. You ever have a time in your life when you're just kind of cold? I don't mean sin. I don't mean uh, you were acting like you were a Christian here, but really being ungodly someplace else. I mean just a time when you just feel like your prayers weren't getting through and uh, it just having kind of a, a cold time in your life. I've had one about the last 44 years. But um, I'll tell you what I was doing. Uh, I had, I'm, I'm going through this cold period of time in my life. I'm coming home, home from my first year of Bible college. And uh, I'm going from, uh, I, I, it was down in Pensacola, Florida. I'm driving back up to Ohio. And I'm somewhere in the south, and I, 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 here's the interstate. I drive off the interstate because I need gas in my truck. And I pull over to this gas station. I get gas, and i got to go back and, and hit the interstate. That's back in the days when they pumped the gas, and you paid them at the pump. And so this kid, you know, he, he fills my truck with gas, and, he, and I pay him. And I give him, a, I give him a track. Well, now I pull out, and i got to go hit the interstate and keep heading north. Guys, I, I, mean, I mean, like, here's the pumps. I pulled out. I got on the, on the road. A quarter, I'm, not, I'm, I'm 100 yards from the, the uh, on-ramp. I'm right across the street from the, the gas station I just gave this, this kid a track at. And the devil got in my truck. The devil sat down right beside me in my truck. You know what he said? He said this. If that guy that you just gave that track to knew how spiritually cold you are right now, he'd throw that thing away. I thought, that is so true. If he knew... The, the coldness, not, not sin, not hypocrisy, but I thought if he knew the coldness in my heart right now, he'd throw that gospel track away. And about that time, guys, the Holy Spirit reached in that truck and grabbed the devil right here and threw him out, out alongside the road and sat down beside me and he said this, but nothing about you sticks to that paper. I don't know where you are spiritually, I hope you don't think you are where you need to be, because if you are where you need to be, I can leave now. You don't need me here. You understand? But guys, I don't care what is cold about you. I don't care what your cowardice is. I don't care where you failed God. I don't care where you're ashamed of yourself. Do you understand that nothing about you when you grab that paper and pass it on, nothing about you sticks to that paper? In fact, you know what the Holy Spirit, He gave me a little revelation. He said, uh, my word shall not return unto me void. You know what I realized right then and there? I, I can't influence these. I don't look. Me passing it, if I'm right with God, doesn't make it more the word of God. And if I'm cold, doesn't make it any less. The track does the job, but it only does the job if I pass it. I had a great revelation, guys. Guys, increase your aggressive Christianity by passing tracks. I increase your aggressive Christianity by bringing somebody to church. If by chance you're here right now and, and you wouldn't know exactly what to do, if somebody said, show me how to be saved, if, if that would stump you, bring them here. You know, I got a feeling if you brought somebody here and they were lost and, and at the end of the service they said, I want to know how to be saved, I'll bet you somebody could show them how. If it's a guy, some man would take him. If it's a girl, some woman would take him. And before they leave this room, somebody would find out how to get to heaven. Isn't that right? Do you know how I got saved? I did not get saved reading a gospel tract. I did not get saved because somebody knocked on my door and led me to Christ at the door. I got saved because a Christian who could not have led me to Christ invited me to church. And I came to a church like this. When they gave the invitation, I came forward. I got down on my knees and I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior because somebody brought a visitor to church. Guys, now I'm going to tell you how to, how to bring people to church. And when I do this, this will guarantee all your friends will never get saved 
because you'll never invite them. Because you're Baptist. Here's how you do it. Tell your lost friend this. Come to church with me Sunday, and if you'll come Sunday, after church we'll go out to eat and I'll buy. If it's going to mean you parting with some of your money, you'd rather let the world go to hell, guys. But I'm telling you, bring somebody to church. So as far as your aggressive Christianity, past gospel tracts, bring people to church. Win somebody to the Lord. Oh, the way to the preacher, you said if I'm not good at talking to people. Yes, I did. But come on, guys. Look, are you going to heaven? Okay. When you get there, don't you want somebody, don't you want at least one person to walk up and hug your neck and say, thanks for winning me to Christ? I want somebody there. Yeah, I'm going to find out, you know, I brought somebody to church and they got saved, or I invited them, told them how to get there, or I, I dropped a track somewhere and they picked it up and got saved. Okay, that's all good. But guys, I want somebody there because of my direct action, because I hunted them down, I dealt with them, I led them to Christ. I want somebody there who's going to hug my neck and say, thanks, I'm here because of you. I understand they're there because of Jesus Christ, but you understand what I'm saying when I say that. Let me tell you about New York. I pastored in upstate New York. Now, upstate New York, when, whenever, whenever somebody says New York, you see the city. You see, you know, uh, Manhattan, and you see the Empire State Building, and you see all the drugs and taxis. And No, 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 no. That's not upstate. Upstate is the five finger lakes. It used to be called the fingers of God. I was up in the finger lakes. That is very rural. It's like this right here. In fact, let me tell you how rural it was. I'm from Ohio, and even Ohio wasn't this rural. In, where, I was, where I pastored my church, doctors had their offices in their house. It was a room, an, a young, unused bedroom in their house. Guys, Ohio was beyond that for years before I got to New York. And so, so where I was at, I mean, we had trees that God planted, not man. We didn't have to go to Central Park to see them, okay? So it was very rural, very beautiful. <coughs> but there is one thing about New Yorkers. They all got the same attitude. They're all sarcastic and caustic and... And they, they just tend to be that way. I don't know what it is. There's just something about them. Big city, little city, uh, little country. They all have this. Uh, you ask somebody what time it is, what do you care? This is how they are. I was talking to a guy from Tennessee, truck driver. Good old boy. We call him Mr. Low Blood Pressure. Uh, his blood pressure was like one over four. And he told me the first time he went up to New York City. He had to go up to New York City and pick up a load. He didn't know the rope. Here's all these trucks, nose to tail, nose to tail, nose to tail. And, and they're waiting to get up to the docks. He said, he said, I just drove past them. And he said, I thought, look at them fellas just sitting there. And he said, I pulled up. He said, I backed up to the dock. And he said, this fella came out. And he said, he got right here. And he said, his face was red and his veins was sticking out. And he has got his fist like this. And he's screaming at me and he's cussing me. And he said, I knew he was going to hit me. So I decked him. I love it. Wish I could have been there. Anyway, he drops this guy like a bad habit. And this guy goes and gets his boss and this doc foreman says, hey, he said, these guys from down south, you don't talk to them like talk to New Yorkers. He wasn't going to punch the guy. That's just how two New Yorkers talk. Well, I pastored in this little town and we needed a vacuum cleaner for our church. I go in this little local sweeper shop and there's a guy there running this shop, lost guy by the name of Bob Borging. Bob Borging was a typical New Yorker, just as sarcastic as the day is long. But when he found out I was a preacher, he went into afterburner. He really got on my case. You guys may not know this, but I can be sarcastic. I'm up to the challenge. And I'll tell you, here we are standing in this, in this little sweeper sales room, and we're like two little terrier dogs. And, and we're just going at each other. You go, oh, you guys are fighting? No, I'm just up to the challenge. So I buy the sweeper. I would come back. Every now and then I'd come back. I didn't, need, uh, I didn't need bags or belts or anything. Things running just fine. I would walk in because Bob had some real strange things he believed. And, and I would walk in. And, and as soon as I'd walk in the door, he'd see it was me. He'd go, what do you want today, preacher? And i go, nothing, Bob. I don't need anything. I said, I just want to come by and see what new stupid thing you believe. You say you didn't. I sure did. Because he, belie he believed some stupid things and that were totally untapped. And so, you know, within five minutes, we're going at it again. I'd leave. A couple more days later, hey, Bob, what new dumb thing do you believe? Say, what happened? I won. 
Bob Borgian got saved. I led Bob Borgian to the Lord. When Bob got saved, he and his wife were divorced. They got back together, got remarried. And uh, he had a couple, of, he had a, a teenage son and a teenage daughter. And after we left there, he, he actually lived 50 miles away in another town, found a King James Bible-believing independent Baptist church in his town, got baptized, got in church, and, and, and he just came over to Auburn, where I pastored, to run his business, but he, he had him a church. And um, we were on the road. We left the church there in 86 to go back on the road. And, and maybe a year or two afterwards, Bob sent us a Christmas card. And it was, uh, it was a different Bob Borging. He's telling me about how happy him and his wife are. He's telling me what his kids are doing for the Lord. He's telling me about the great message that his pastor preached Sunday. And then he says, and he said, but the best part of my Sunday is, you ready for this? After, I, after the morning service, I get to go to the nursing home and I get to preach people there. See, Bob refused to be a pew warmer. And after giving me this kind of a little history blurb, just before he signed his name, he put one more line on that Christmas card. You know what it said? Thanks for winning me to Christ. I'm going to ask you something. You're going to heaven. You're assured of that, okay? When you get there, is not one person going to walk up to you and hug your neck and say, I am here because of you. Thanks for winning me to Christ. Don't you? I didn't say, did I say win a dozen? Did I say win a hundred? I said one. You can get one, can't you? Let me tell you how you get one. Now, I, I know this is fishing and hunting country. I'm not a hunter, guys. I'm not against hunting. I'm not against hunting. I was raised in the city. Um, for me, when I go hunting, when I go in the woods with a long gun, the only thing that's endangered are tree limbs, bird's nests, and low-flying planes. I'm not a fisherman. When I go fishing, it is worm murder. When I put the fish on the hook, I apologize. To, I mean, when I put the worm on the hook, I apologize to the worm. It's not a worm's rights thing. I don't care if this worm's going to die. I care if it's going to die for nothing. I go out there. You know how I look at fishing? It's like a day in prison with a chance of drowning on top of that. I mean, when I see a bunch of guys fishing, you and I think, I could be writing a book. When I pastored my church, a man in my church took me fishing. I went fishing. I caught a fish. It was about, oh... I'm trying to get exactly right. Anyway, he says, uh, I bring it in. He said, I'll take it off the hook for you, preacher. That's fine. Take it off the hook. He takes my fish off my hook and goes like this and throws it back in the water. Oh, no, I am not into catch. If I, if I catch it and I release it, I'm going to release it into a frying pan. And I know he's not into catch and release. I said, what did you just do? He goes, oh, too small to keep. I said, hey, hey, big enough to bite? big enough to keep. Simple philosophy. If it's stupid enough to bite this stupid worm, it's, it's big enough to... Nope. So I catch about a half a dozen of these things, and he's pitching every one of them back. And I, this is not sitting well. Finally, I catch one like this. I said, hmm, that's bigger. He takes off the hook. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I said, wasn't that big enough to keep? He said, well, yeah, if we had some to go with it, it'd be worth keeping. We had some to keep. I threw him in the lake. But I, I think I got my fishing problem solved. I really do. I think next time I go fishing, I'm going to light the bait before I throw it in the water. <laughs> but I, I say this. I'm not a hunter. I'm not a fisher. But look, if I'm out fishing and some fish leaps into my boat, do you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to pick this up and go, oh, little fishy, you got caught in my boat here. Go home. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know what I'm going to say? John Calvin got you, buddy. John Calvin sent you to me. This was predestined for the, for the foundation of the world. And tomorrow your mother will call you, but you won't hear. Because I'm taking you home, and I'm going to eat you. I am telling you the truth, guys. I know what to do when a fish jumps in a boat. If you've never won anybody to Christ, I'm going to tell you what to pray. Say this. God, I want to win at least one person before the Lord, before you come back. Give me an easy one. Can you have an easy one? Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you a great thing. I don't know if you guys have a, a day vacation Bible school, summer day vacation Bible school, but it might be a real good time to start. You say, why? Get one of them kids. Lead a kid to the Lord. They still get to heaven. That guy at my father-in-law's funeral got saved when he was eight years old. Get somebody. Let me tell you about an easy one. My wife and I were doing some door knocking, and, and, uh, and, and here's this guy. Now, 
You know, here's why some of you are afraid to go door knocking and visiting. Well, somebody's going to ask me how Noah get the animals on the ark and where did Cain get his wife? I'm sitting here. We're, we're there like three minutes. I show this guy the gospel and he says this. Oh, that's good. Can I do that right now? I said, you, I said, you want to do that right now? He said, yeah, can I do that right now? I said, well, yeah, yeah. He goes, I said, you want to do that right here? Yeah, yeah, can I do that right here? I thought, well, yeah, I mean, you can. I, I want to say, where'd Cain get his wife, Smarty? In 15 minutes, this guy's kneeling at his couch, and he trusted Christ. You say, what was he? An easy one. Why don't you ask God for an easy one? Because an easy one will still walk up to you and hug your neck in heaven. Say, thanks. Thanks for praying. Thanks for winning me to Christ. Guys, as far as your aggressive Christianity, pass gospel tracts, bring visitors, and win souls. The third thing, and I'm done. You need, to make, you need to strengthen your freedom of worship. You need to strengthen your aggressive Christianity. You need to strengthen your tie to this book. Oh, I don't think you can believe your Bible any more than you believe it. You already believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I know that. I, you've, you've, you've achieved that. But let me ask you a question. What good is believing that book if you don't read it? It's totally useless. You probably have heard this. I, hear this. I heard this story around the country. The only thing that ever changes is sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman. It's not the same story. This story repeats itself over and over and over again. You got this old man, old woman, pushing a stolen grocery cart, picking up tin cans and whatever, lives in a house with 14 cats, and one cold winter, nobody sees them for about two weeks, and they kick in the door and find out they froze to death because they couldn't pay for their electric bill or the gas bill. Everybody goes, oh, that's so sad. They didn't have enough money to pay their utilities. Now the county comes in to clean up this house. Usually, it's under the bed. They pull out a box, and there's a million dollars. You go, what a fool. They had a million dollars. Yeah, they had a million dollars in a box under their bed, but they never opened it up and partook of their wealth. They lived like a pauper and died like one, right? You say, yeah, they're a fool. I think they're a genius. I think they're a genius compared to you. If you shoot your mouth off about believing the King James Bible is the Word of God, and never open it up and read it? You never open it up and partake of the wealth that God gave you? Guys, if you're not reading that book, start reading the book. You say, well, preacher, I am reading the Bible. Look, I think you ought to read every word, every single word. You mean the names. I mean the names. Yeah, I mean the names. I got a preacher, you know, he'd, he'd read Chronicles like this. And Butch begat Butch. And Butch begat Butch. And Butch begat Butch. I think that's funny. That's not what it says. I'm not even sure when we get to heaven, we won't find out that, that when the Lord was writing Chronicles, he threw a bunch of scrabble pieces on the floor and said, put that in there to keep them busy. <laughs> I, when I read Chronicles, here's what I do. I'm trying to serve the Lord. Uh, and, I, and, and while I'm trying to serve the Lord, I think I break his heart. I mean, if I can hurt him inadvertently, I think he deserves the laugh. So I say the names. When I'm reading Chronicles, here's what I picture going up in heaven, going on in heaven. Here's God watching me read Chronicles, and he's going, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, Mike, Gabe, come here, come here. You guys got to hear this. I am God, and I never thought that those letters, those letters in that order would make that sound right there. <laughs> hey, guys, I think you ought to read every word in the Bible, okay? If you are not reading it, start reading it. If you are reading it, read more of it. Um, I tell people this, and I stand by it. First off, here's what you ought to do. If you've got a Bible reading program that gets you through every word, keep it up. Don't change. If you've got something that works for you, fine. If you are not reading through your Bible and haven't been through it yet, oh man, listen, you know what you don't want to have happen? You don't want the Lord to come back and take us home and you haven't read that book once yet. So here's what you do. I think you ought to read a proverb for the date. Today is the 12th. You should have read Proverbs 12. Tomorrow's the 13th. Read Proverbs 13. Next day's 14th. Read Proverbs 14. Now, because you're Americans and you're crooked, I've got to explain this. On February 28th, you read 28, 29, 30, and 31. You don't skip three, okay? But a proverb for the date will put you through the book of Proverbs 12 times a year. Better than that, it'll put the book of Proverbs through you 12 times a year. Then there's no, and here's my words, valid reason. There is no valid excuse 
why every adult in this room can't read a minimum of 10 pages of your Bible every day. I did not say chapters. I said pages. Read 10 pages. Start at page 1 and read to page 10. The next day, read to page 20. The next day, read to page 30. Now, I know what somebody just did. Somebody just went, 10 pages, man, that's a lot. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I'm not even, even going to prove it. Uh, see if somebody else can prove it here. I like to read. How many of you also just really like to read? Let me see your hands. You just enjoy reading. Okay, all you who did not raise your hands, have you seen our coloring book? Just, just want to let you know we got something for everybody. But um, now you people that just raised your hands because you like to read, you sat down with an uninspired book. I don't care if, I don't care if it's my book. Look, the only, the only inspired words you're going to find in here is where I quote this. I have never penned one word inspired of God. Do you understand that? And, and do you ever sit down with an uninspired book and you knocked out 50 or 60 or 70 pages a night? What did you say? I just couldn't put it down. Isn't that amazing? It makes complete sense to you to read an uninspired book, 60 pages, but read a mere 10 of the book you say you love and that's unreasonable? Guys, uh, that's just, you just got to understand, it. that is the book. Uh, you say, well, I, I was talking to a lady one time. Now, I have two questions. When, when somebody's going through some trials uh, and they come to me, my first question is this. Have you been reading your Bible? I usually get no. But if I get a yes, I go, every day? And that's where they have to say, well, no, not every day. Now, I was talking to this lady one time. And I said, uh, well, have you been reading your Bible? She said, yes. Hmm. I said, every day? She said, every day. Wow, that's my two best shots. And she took them both. And it, then it came to me. I said, how much? And she said this like she had good sense. A page. A page? You, a page? Come on, guys. Guys, you sit up. Look, there's uh, 1,353 pages in my Bible. One page a day put me through it once every four years. Now, I can't think of anything I want to do once every four years, maybe like an audit or see my mother-in-law. But I mean, we have root canal. Guys, you ought to want to get through that book. Well, preacher, you know, uh, here's what I'm going to challenge. I'm going to challenge you here. If you think reading one page of the Bible a day is okay, don't read anything else more than one page a day. And suddenly I'm unreasonable again. Guys, you're close to Route 40, aren't you? Okay. Go to Route 40. Go west. Keep driving west. You'll be 250 miles away from Amarillo, Texas when you see the first billboard. It'll say, come to the Big Texan Restaurant. The Big Texan Restaurant's just on the north side of, of I-40 as you go through Amarillo. The Big Texan Restaurant has a steak called the Big Texan. It is 72 ounces. Guys, this thing is so big, they kill two cows to make it. And if you buy the Big Texan and eat the whole thing, you don't have to pay for it. It's free. Now, you have to pay for the ambulance, but you have to pay for the steak. Could you imagine you've got a friend that loves steak, and you say, I'm going to buy you the Big Texan. And they get, get, they get it cooked just like they like. Man, it's there. They take a bite of it. It's, oh, that is perfect. See, you like it? Yeah, that is great. They eat their one bite, and they go, okay, we can go now. Well, you're not going to eat any more? Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to take it home, and I'll have another bite tomorrow. You know what I would say? Get out of the way, pal. I am a Baptist preacher. I'll show you what to do with a dead cow. <laughs> what I'm telling you guys, you're going to read one page. You need to read that book. Now, I seldom say this. Look, 10 pages a day will put you through your Bible three to three and a half times a year. Now, I know what somebody else just said. You mean when I get done reading it, I have to read it again? Yeah, you know that book you love? That book you claim came from God? That you'd rather watch TV than read? Then you'll read anything that's out there. You'll read the newspaper. You'll read uninspired books. But you won't read this book that you say you love. Guys, let me tell you something. You read that book, and when you're done, you read it again. As soon as you're done, you read it again. When you're finished, you read it again. Then you read it again. Say, when can I quit reading it? You can quit reading it when you die or you hear a real loud trumpet. And there's no other two excuses for that. You just keep reading that book. You say, why should I keep reading the Bible over and over? You want to know why? Because I like to kiss my wife. Yeah, that's the reason. You read your Bible over and over because I like to kiss my wife. I told you, Kathy and I have been married almost 43 years. I do not know how many times I've kissed my wife in 43 years, but not enough. I haven't kissed her yet, and I went, 
Okay, that is enough of that. Handshake from here on out. <laughs> well, come on, what do you love to do? Come on, you're the hunter? You like hunting? Oh, I love to go hunting. Yo, know, I love hunting, really. How many times did you go last year? Oh, man, I went like uh, once. Well, I don't want to overdo a good thing. I love to fish. Really? Yeah, I got a boat. I got a truck. I got the motor. I got the trolley motor. I got $1,500 worth of fishes up. Really? How many times did you go fishing last year? Oh, I went once. Wouldn't want to overdo a good thing. I don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm of an earthly good. Guys, if there's something you love to do, when you get done doing it, you know what? You want to do it again. I thought you loved that book. You read it, and you read it, and you read it. Ten pages a day. Now, I seldom say this, but I'm going to say it for your benefit. If you can't read ten pages, read three a day. When you get done with three, read four a day. When you get done the next, you get through it the next time, read five a day. When you get done, add one. Add one. Work up to ten. Guys, ten is not unreasonable. I left my church in 1986 to go back on the road. I call my minister a friend of churches. Guys, let me tell you, you know what the, you know what the verse is that describes me better than any other verse? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's the guy that's preaching to you. I am not wicked. I am desperately wicked. And I'm preaching. And I'm not going to get a new heart until I die or the Lord comes back. Right? So what do I do? Well, the only hope I've got is to suppress the wickedness that is natural to me. So I tell you to read 10. I don't read 10 pages of my Bible every day. I read 30. This gold marker... That's my proverb for the date. I read 20 pages of the Old Testament, that this red ribbon. This blue one, I read 10 pages of the new. 30 pages a day puts me through it every 45 days. It puts me through my Bible eight times a year. I don't read eight times a year to find new sermons or to find something nobody else found. I read eight times a year to suppress the wickedness of the most wicked individual that I have to deal with on a personal basis, me. You might be more wicked than me, but I'm out of here Thursday. And I'm not taking you with me. I'm taking me with me. And that's a mess. So guys, as far as, as far as your dedication to this book, you ought to increase your dedication. If you're not reading it, start reading it. If you are reading it, read more of it. And then I just can't believe this. I cannot believe this. I can understand the lost world saying, don't read the Bible. You know I've had preachers say that? I've had preachers say, oh, well, Gip tells you, 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 you read this much a day, just so you, you, you know, like you're obligated, just so you can put a check mark in your Bible how many times you read it. Uh, I don't count how many times I've read my Bible. I tell them this. I said, so what do you count? Come on, what do you count? Grandkids? What do you count? A golf score? Uh, you're not hanging any dead animals around your house trying to count something, are you? You don't count how many tracks you pass. You don't count many how, how many people you won to Christ. Guys, everybody counts something, don't they? But I don't tell you to read your Bible so you can count it. You know what I tell people? When you read your Bible, let me tell you how to read your Bible. Get out of your chair. Most people don't read standing up. Get out of your chair. And get out of your living room. And get out of your house. And get out of the time in which you live and enter what you're reading. You know, guys, if you would enter what you've read, it might mean something to you. You know what's wrong with us in our Bible reading? We read the miraculous. And go to the next verse. We read of the Red Sea parting. And we just go to the next verse. Guys, guys. You know what you need to do? Don't read about the Red Sea parting. You know what you need to do? Show up over those sand dunes the night before it happens with the Jewish dad and his eight-year-old son. There's the Red Sea. They can't get across it. They can't get around it. And here comes Pharaoh's army. Can you see this eight-year-old kid saying to his dad, Daddy, what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do now? And the dad says, what are you going to do, son? Now, don't sit there and go, well, I would just tell him God will probably part it and we'll cross on dry ground. You wouldn't say that. Because every time you've had a crisis, you got mad at God. You didn't look for a miracle. I can just see this Jewish father saying, uh, we're going to die, son. We're going to die. Moses told us we're going to have a, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I thought I'm going to have my own farm for you and your brothers and sisters and your mom. But we're not getting away from them. We're not getting around that. I'm sorry, son. Could you imagine that hopelessness? And the next day you wake up and the Red Sea's gone. I'll tell you what, brother, if you never shout in your life, you'd shout that day, wouldn't you? Guys, you ought to enter what you're reading. Do you understand that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh? Do you understand he was a, don't get me wrong when I say this, small-time Galilean prophet? 
He was a country boy. He was up there in Galilee. Most of his ministry took place 70 miles away from Jerusalem. And he was 30 years old. You know what we call that? Kid. I talked, you know, I talked 35 year olds and, 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 I, and I'll go, I'll say, I'll tell to Kathy, I'll say, that's a nice kid. She goes, you shouldn't call him a kid. I said, babe, my oldest son is 38 and he was a Marine and I call him a kid. Do you know what it was like for a 30 year old kid to walk up to a bunch of Pharisees who are 60 years old and say, you bunch of hypocrites? Can you see this? Here's a widow. She's lost the only child that she has. Her son has died. That's a heartbreak, guys. That's a heartbreak. And you're watching this funeral procession. You're going, how sad. And all of a sudden, oh, here comes that Jesus kid. And those followers, oh, he's stopping the funeral. He'll, do, he'll, he'll interrupt the funeral just to get attention on himself. Oh, now he's talking to the dead body. That's smart. How many people talk to dead people and look, the body just sat up? The body's hugging its mother. And they're going home together. Guys, if you would enter what you're reading, it'd change your life. It'd change your life. Guys, if, if you really love that book, I'm not asking if you don't love it. I'm not saying you don't love it. I don't know how you can love it and stay away from it. I mean, there's a difference between loving it as being a check mark on, the, on a piece of paper that says, do you love the Bible? And you check yes. There's a vast difference between that and saying, I just can't stay away from it. I'll tell you this. I'll be done. I'll tell you how I learned to read my Bible. Guy gave me a red lead pencil. And he said, Sam, there's no, there was no Bible in our Catholic home. I searched for a Bible when I was 19 years old. I searched our house. There was no Bible to be found. So I bought a Bible. And this guy said, take a red lead pencil. And he said, he said, when you read your Bible, he said, he said, just draw a red line. If a, if a verse stands out, shade it in in red. Guys, did you ever see a verse and it really caught your attention and you didn't mark it? And you haven't seen it since? I can't prove this. I can't prove this, but it won't surprise me at all when we get to heaven and find out that while we're asleep, God slips a new verse in the Bible. And you see it the next day, and if you don't mark it, He takes it back out that night. And you'll never find it again. But if you mark it, it's in there. And so I'm reading my Bible, I'm going like this. Oh, man, that's good. Oh, this is really good. Oh, man, this is good. I was having a time. And then I found me in the Bible. And those are always very depressing moments. And I found this verse, man. It hit me right in the breastbone. And here's it. Now, look, what I'm telling you is a study, not in the wickedness of man, but in the wickedness of Sam Gipp. Here's this verse, and it got me under conviction. I said this. I think I'll read somewhere else. Just like that. And God said, go back and put a red line through that. I said, that said something bad about me. He said, the guy didn't say if it said something good about you, put a red line through. He said, if it stood out. Did it stand out? Yeah, it stood out. Yeah, it stood out. I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure I could find it again. <laughs> You'll help me. I bet you will. Here's what I said. I said, yeah, that could possibly, that just, yeah, that is it, isn't it? I said, I hope that's it. I'd hate to think you put it in there twice. And then I said this, like I had good sense, like I was honest. I said, I'm going to put a light line in it. I hate to mark in your holy Bible. This looks like, it looks like there's been a butcher shop going on here. I mean, there's, there's red spots all over my Bible. Today I get a new conviction. Don't mark in a verse. And God said this, press down. Okay. But you know what's happening? I was becoming connected to my Bible. You need to be connected to that book. You listen. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I had this happen, that, that answer book. Came into a church like this one, never been there. A man walked up to me. He said, I've read your answer book three times. I've never met you, but by reading it three times, I feel like I already know you. I understand that. You know why? You guys that read, you read the book, but you read the author, right? You learn what the author wants to teach you about some subject, but you also learn things about the author, do you not? Now, you listen very carefully if you don't remember anything else. If you do not read your Bible, all you will ever know about God is what somebody else tells you. It might be a preacher. Might be somebody you trust. Doesn't matter. All you'll ever know about God is what somebody else tells you about him. And you know, he ends up being like the guy doing the talking. And if it makes me mad, it makes God mad. If it makes me glad, it makes God glad. If it makes me sad, it makes God sad. Guys, that's not an answer. I'm telling you, you need to read that book. We, uh, we got this motorhome about uh, a little over a month ago. 
And we had to move from the old one to the new one. And there was a pastor and his, his wife. Uh, we'd known his wife for years, preached to her uh, when she was a little girl down in Texas where her dad pastored. And, and so her and her, her, she's now married to a preacher. And they brought a young guy. Uh, he was 37 years old. Up until he was 11, he was normal. When he was 11, he got brain cancer. And they did surgery. He's real slow. Oh, he worked. But every time he'd do something, he'd go, oh, uh, you know, he'd go, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not very smart. I said, well, you're doing okay. And every time something happened, he'd go, oh, did I do anything wrong? So, man, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. He's very slow. He has read his Bible cover to cover 15 times. You say, I think that's wonderful. I think that's really bad news for some of you. I mean, you understand what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ? When you try to give God your lame excuse, I fall asleep. Uh, it was too hard for me to read. I lost my place. I couldn't say the names. Whatever lame excuse you use for not reading that Bible, do you understand what's going to happen when, when God has this young kid testify against you? And then you said you loved him. Guys, look at the verse. And I'll be done. Look at verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. What's the next five words? That are ready to die. How long before passing gospel tracts will be against the law? How long before preaching from a pulpit will be against the law? I believe you're going to see the day when you tell somebody they're going to hell. That's going to be genocide. It's going to be against the law. How long before it'll be against the law to read that book? You say, oh, it's not going to happen. You never thought you'd see men marrying men in this country, did you? You ever thought you'd see killing babies as a million dollar business in this country, but it's happening. Isn't that true? Guys, it says that are ready to die. I am telling you that we are going to lose the things we have. Not if we hang on to them and maintain them. We're going to lose them if we don't strengthen, increase them. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. In just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and Brother Tom will come and, and uh, give you the invitation. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed,